church that was somewhere in the country, <coughs> let's say in the south, and it has the big billboard in the front, you know, where you can take the plastic letters and you stick them up there with the pole, kind of like it raised, you know, and you put the church little whimsical saying. <coughs> and this church said, adultery, having your Kate and Edith too. <laughs> story. I, I saw this, the marquee, and it said, uh, adultery is a sin. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. Uh. Have you come up here and do that? <laughs> <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have waited. I thought it was cute. <laughs> I have something else to add to that, just in case uh, that, that didn't work, but I, I think it worked with this help. Um, <laughs> I'll read something to you, but I, I, it's always tickled me a little bit. Um, an ecumenical time, a big word that we don't use a lot in the church these days, but an ecumenical event is where different denominations come together under one roof and share in the gospel of Christ. Okay? Where they share a common theology, or they share something, but it's many denominations coming together. So during an economical gathering, Someone rushed in shouting, the building's on fire! The Methodist at once gathered in the corner and prayed. The Baptist cried, everybody into the water! <laughs> the Lutherans posted a notice on the door declaring fire was evil because it was the natural abode of the devil. The Congregationalists shouted, every man for himself! The Seventh-day Adventist proclaimed, it's the vengeance of an angry God. The Christian scientists agreed among themselves that there was no fire. <laughs> the Presbyterians appointed a chairperson <laughs> to appoint a committee to look into the matter and make a written report to the next session. Oh my goodness. The Episcopalians formed a procession and marched out in good order. <laughs> and the Unitarian Universalists concluded that the fire has as much right to be there as any other. <laughs> and finally, the Catholics passed the collection plate to pay for the damage. <laughs> That's a really good one. Not less ecumenical gatherings. Well, we have our couple who we seem <laughs> to. Uh, Still on their trip, it appears. Though we both know, or we all know, that the car is back in the driveway at home. But they're still owed a little vacation, a little downtime, a little re-entry time. So we'll just pretend that they're still off fishing somewhere, and uh, we'll give them that space uh, that they still need. They still need. Last week, yeah, if you were not here, last week we had a sermon, a message. Basically saying, to start the race, which is really to accept Christ as your Savior, and then to stay on the course. Stay on the course. And so I put up a picture of these athletes as if they're running a race in perhaps Greece, and they're all charging ahead with a goal in mind to get to the finish line. And that was somewhat of the overarching theme of the last week's so talk. So we're talking about running our race and staying the course. That is, keeping in our Christian walk by navigating our lives with a biblical perspective. We cited in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths as you are an athlete and you're running your course, you don't want to be veering off to the left or off to the right, taking longer to run. You want a straight path to do what you need to do to complete your goal of a runner, of an athlete. And I think that's what the Lord is saying here. He will make your paths straight. I spoke, and I'm kind of referring now past tense, I spoke at that time last week of two 
past teachings of Pastor Russ's. And this is somewhat of a summation for you who were not here. I'm going to kind of cover a little bit, uh, bring stuff off to speak. Pastor Russ uh, was, at one point, he was at the end of Mark's gospel, uh, and the writer of Mark, Mark, leaves us hanging with the women that learn of Jesus' resurrection as told by an angel. Boom, end of story. And you're supposed to go, wow, well, you know, there's, there's more to it than that, but that's where Pastor Russ left us with. Women frightened that Jesus is no longer in his tomb, and an angel said, you will meet him elsewhere. The other teaching is that of Ecclesiastes, where the writer indicates that everything is meaningless, and we've heard that many, many times in Russ's teaching, everything is meaningless, but to stand in awe of God and to fear God and keep his commandments. Amen. For this is the whole duty of man. Hallelujah. Now, I, I somewhat preempted the rest of Mark, the uh, rest of Russ's teaching in Mark, because that ultimately comes to the last chapter of what we're to get out of that gospel. But that is where that heads in Ecclesiastes. That's right. After all is said and done, the writer of Ecclesiastes is basically foretelling of something bigger than anything under the sun. And then we, here, have the luxury nearly 3,000 years later since Ecclesiastes was written, of knowing about God's Son, Jesus. Thank you. Who is necessary for the meaningless to become meaningful. Hallelujah. And I think about that every time I think in my mind of Pastor Russ going meaningless, meaningless. It's all meaningless. It's toil. It's meaningless. And we have Christ. point of all this is, to kind of still catch us up, have we made that decision yet? Have we made that decision to allow Christ into our lives so that we can make meaningless into meaningful? That decision of a commitment of faith to believe that Jesus paid for our sin by his atoning death on the cross and has promised us eternal life for those who believe in his name. Mm -hmm. If so, then our duty is to calibrate our hearts to stay the course. There's that term again, to stay the course. If we're going to start our race, let's now stay the course. In the midst of our personal race, let's stay the course. And one must stay in God's words and listen to him speak to us through his spirit. John said in 831, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. We've heard it before in this church. The main thing is to keep the main thing. The main, the main thing. thing. And the main thing is Jesus. Jesus. In the context of what we are continuing with today, Jesus is saying, calibrate your heart to me. Follow me, and you will stay the course. Mm, thank you, Lord. We spoke last week of Jesus meeting people along his journey, and he says to them over and over, follow me, follow me, follow me. And we discussed, what does that mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What should I see in my life? And we then discovered that we had an answer to that. And Pastor Russ gave it to us as the acronym of ROPE, R-O-P-E. Repentance, obedience, perseverance, and remember this, evangelism, while remembering to only use words if necessary. In other words, evangelism should really be shown by our actions, not a lot by our speech. We also review several subtle ways in which the prince of this world distracts us from ever putting our faith in Christ and thereby starting our race. Ways mentioned were through TV programming, purportedly to be spiritually enlightening, or popular self-growth adages, need a balanced life, 
or New Age self-help books with explanations of enlightenment about your deity self within. All these are distractions, distractions to keep you from understanding and knowing the true Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to speak in code for those of you who were here last Sunday. Sorry you weren't here last Sunday, but for those who were here, you didn't think that golfing could be so heavy in a theological <laughs> And the rest of you are going, what in the dickens is he talking about? <laughs> My three amigos who were used as a golf illustration last Sunday. So, for all of us, in summary of last week, Last week's message isn't about getting spiritual. No. It's not about cleaning up your act. It's not about stopping this or stopping that or don't go here, don't go there, or don't go do this. Okay? It's about understanding who Jesus is, what he said he was, what he said you and I are, and then living your life and death. And that is truly what it's all about. Yes. Keeping the main thing the main, the main thing. thing. <laughs> it's not working, honey. <laughs> Susan said, everybody loves to see a map. Put a map up there. We all love to see Russ's map. Put a map up there. The love a map. The love a map. <laughs> I didn't see anybody go, oh, I love that map. Wow, that's a nice map, Ken. Cool ships. Yeah, cool ships. Thank you. You got to see something else. Oh. Nice map. This week, since we were just talking about rope, R O P E, I want to touch on an example of, remember in rope we had repentance? I want to touch on an example of fault. I shared with you that Susan and I were from a small mega church. Does that, that work? Small mega church? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> it does, though. Because, you know, uh, we used to teach classes and groups. She would have the women, I would have the men. And in one of my groups, uh, a fellow came up to me. And afterwards, he shared his current circumstance. He said he is on cocaine, that he's been stealing from his business, he hasn't paid his taxes, he's having sex with his secretary, and his wife is upset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I said to him, are you a Christian? And he said, I couldn't get through this without Christ. Oh, dear. I saw some eyebrows go up. You see, you can't be true to your faith and use Christ as your crutch continue in your sin behavior. Mm -hmm. There's your false repentance. He never repented at all in just using Christ as your crutch and all those activities that I mentioned. I've had experiences like that all over the place. My favorite one of all time is when I asked a guy, are you a Christian? And he said to me, last answer, 
He said to me, not in the biblical sense. <laughs> the culture has done so much to the word Christian that it really no longer has any meaning. And if you've been around this church for a while, you might remember multiple years ago, we had an Andy Stanley video mm -hmm. up on the screen for a Sunday. And it basically was, Christianity, it's not what you think. Mm -hmm. And he went through a marvelous explanation about how the word Christian has really gotten diluted in time. I still use the term. I use it not as frequently as I used to. Uh, I've substituted it really for what I think is a more biblical term, uh, a group of words, and that is follower of Christ. Follower of Christ. I'm going to give you in the next 20 minutes just like a shotgun full of stuff to try to convince you that's not right. To try to show you what the scripture says and to try to crystallize some points and bring them home to, to a conclusion. We're still talking today about staying the course. I have a couple of mentors uh, in my life. Uh, I have more heroes and mentors, actually, but there's a difference to me. A mentor is somebody you can see, feel, touch, get on the phone, talk to. Wes Bogren is a mentor to me, honestly. A hero is kind of a guy that's, that he's off in the distance. You know, he's, he's a guy you're never really going to get to. Uh, Mickey Mantle might be a hero to somebody. Okay? But probably, if you said, Ken, you've got to pick one hero. My hero is a guy that wrote a whole bucket full of books in the New Testament, and his name is Paul. I believe if you want to know how to stay the course, there's probably a variety of ways to go about that, probably a bunch of ways that you can get some views on that. There's a guy by the name of Paul, and I think you can go to his life, and you can see what he says and how he stayed the course. If you have your Bibles open, please turn them to Philippians in the third chapter in the twelfth verse. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, has been talking about Christ. In chapter 2, Christ is the model. Have a mind in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Think like Jesus. Have an attitude, and that attitude was an attitude of servant. That's really what this is all about. There. Then Paul begins to talk about his own life. Talks about all that he had done, all the many accomplishments that he had. That, that starts chapter 3. And he says, if anybody in chapter 4 had confidence in the flesh, it could be me, he says. Then he begins to line list them. He says, I was circumcised in the eighth day. Now clearly, Paul had nothing to do with that. He didn't say, hey, mom, it's circumcision day. Let's go down to the synagogue. I want to be first in line. It's not what he meant. What Paul was saying was he was from a godly family. I was of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. What Paul is saying there is he took his faith <coughs> very seriously. He was a very religious man. He did not know Christ at this time. One other thing, kind of a parenthetical insert. When God saved Paul, he really didn't change his personality. He just changed his jersey. Ah, he, yeah. sports metaphor. he didn't say, I got this guy and he's a zealot and I'm going to make him this little meek and mild little he said, I'm going to get off that away jersey and I'm going to put on a home jersey mm. that says, Jesus is Lord. Amen. And that's the difference. I believe that in chapter 3, verses 12, 13, and 14, you get a picture of how Paul stayed the course. I'll make four or five points and you'll be the judge of whether they're worthy or not. We read last week Not that I have already attained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold.
hold of that to which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's a, again a looking at our race, you know, running forward, heading to the prize. And I believe in the context of what we're talking about today, this is Paul saying, I stayed the course. Let me make some points to you. How did he stay the course? Well, here are a couple of things that we see. We see that Paul accepted learning as a lifestyle. I haven't already obtained it. I haven't already figured it out. You never arrive. You're always learning. Amen. You're continually growing. That's right. that, that information out there that you and I are facing right now, out now, out in front, is, is vast. But I'm not really talking about that. This is from the Amplified, from just a couple of verses earlier. Paul says, For I, my determined purpose, is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonder of his person more strongly and more clearly. When I'm talking about continuing to learn, I'm not talking about more information from the community college, that's fine, or reading more Christian books, that's fine. I'm talking to continually learn about Christ. Continually learning about God. Who is he? What's he like? How does he work? Seeing him become more and more clear to me, drawing closer and closer to him. Paul says, I don't know everything I need to know. And it's not that there's an endless search for answers. Most of the questions you ask that have an answer, you can get them. And probably, the problem is that many of these questions you ask don't have a right or wrong answer. Think about it. Where should I live? Should I get married? Where should I work? I want to leave this job. I want to go over here. I want to go over there. I, I want to do all these things. How should I know how to make these choices? Well, the way you know is to learn more and more of what God's like. And you start asking, God, what do you think I ought to do? Um, how should this look? Amen. The first thing that Paul understood is that he accepted his learning as a lifestyle, as a lifelong quest. Here's the second thing. He maintained an accurate <coughs> view of himself. And I think that goes hand in hand with the first. The more and more I understand who God is, the more I will inevitably understand who I am. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think I said it last week. The greatest singular problem any of us have is pride. <laughs> yeah. C.S. Lewis said it this way, that pride is or was the ultimate vice, and it is through pride that Lucifer became the devil. Pride is a subtle thing. Pride is that thing that gets into your life and motivates you to do all sorts of things. It even is that thing that will somehow make you think you're not much. All of a sudden we meet people who have low self-esteem and, and, and I don't think they really do. I think they have very high views of themselves so high that their performance doesn't meet their expectations. Therefore, they think little of themselves. They have very high self-esteem. What's that mean? Pride. Whether you swagger with pride or you feel bad about it, either one is wrong. Because in both cases, you're thinking about you. You need to, what you need is an accurate view of yourself. And you are not going to get an accurate view of yourself by looking to the world. Mm -hmm. You're only going to get an accurate view of yourself. 
yourself by looking to God. Amen. Amen. Do you ever wonder what your value is? Do you ever go through those times when, oh, I'm not worth anything, and you know, and you go through all this self-pity? Show of hands. <laughs> I'm the only one then. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I would be the only one. <laughs> if you ever for a second begin to wonder about your value, simply look to the cross. Mm, yes. That's it. You don't need to look at what you drive, or your financial statement, or where you live, or who you married, or who you didn't marry. Okay? We always seem to get that out of the way. Everybody I know who's single wants to be married. Everybody who's married wants to be single. Everybody go back to back to <laughs> Listen, if you want to understand your value, just look to the cross. Amen. Somebody said it this way. I, I'll, I'll bet you've heard it. That if you were the only person on earth, God would have had to have sent Jesus for you. Hallelujah. I have no clue. I don't know how you figured that out or if it's true, but staying on that metaphor, what I want you to see to help you grasp his love, if you were the only person on earth and Christ came to die for you, then it would have been you that pounded the nails into the cross. Mm. It would have been you that shoved the thorns on his head and jammed the spear in his side. In the midst of that pounding and shoving and jamming, do you wonder if you have value? Mm. Just look to the cross. Wow, that's good. You can do nothing without him. And with him, we can do mighty things. Mm. Jesus said to his disciples the night before he died, you're going to do greater works than I. He meant you're going to do spectacular things and more on them. You're going to see the fruit we got that line, we had to look it up last night, we got that line from uh, old J Tom Cruise, Jerry Maguire, mm -hmm. okay, remember that movie, Tom Cruise was a sports agent, and all of his sports clients would go to Tom, who's the agent, show me the money, show me the money, I'll, I'll sign up and work with that team, but show me the money first, show me the money. Let me tell you what the Christian line is, <laughs> let me tell you what God's saying to you, show me the fruit. Amen. Show me the fruit. Let me see the fruit. Show me the fruit. How do you know if you're pleasing him? Show him the fruit. Mm. Paul's got an accurate view of himself. He doesn't have low self-esteem. He's got an accurate view. And it's interesting, at one point, when he's writing to Timothy, he says, I'm the chief among sinners. He isn't kidding about this. This isn't hyperbole. This is the way he saw himself. And there's a sense in my life which I say the only reason Paul could write that is because I hadn't been born. We talk about feelings. The holiest you should ever feel, I think, is at the point of conversion. Mm -hmm. Because from that moment on, the more I get to know him, the more I see me. Yeah. And the more I see me, the dirtier I look. Yeah. And the more gracious he looks. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means to be loved. That's what it means to love a sinner like us. Mm -hmm. Folks, just don't say those words. Do you understand, and we thought this last week, do you understand we're sinners? We're saved by grace. Yes. He loves us. He saved us. What can we do but to say individually, God, use me. Mm -hmm. Here's the third thing that Paul saw. He said, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He demonstrated a commitment to purpose in his life. He said, I'm moving in a specific direction. I have reason and meaning and understanding and purpose in my life. There's a difference between purpose and 
goals. He's talking about purpose here, not goals. Here's the difference. Goals are something that are short-term. Purpose goes beyond life. Goals are something you can measure. Purpose, really, you can't measure. Goals are something you can attain. Purpose is something you really never attain. And goals are milestones or stepping stones, and purpose defines your life. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I've got this figured out. I'm committed to a purpose, Paul says. But the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward, what is ahead? <clears throat> I call this the law of focus. It's not that he didn't have different roles, Paul. You, you have many different roles here. I have a role as a, as a father, as a role as a husband, a role as a friend, a role, I guess, as a boss, a supervisor. I have a role as a teacher, a role as a mentor, a role as, a role as a, a protege. But Paul says, there's one thing I do. It's the law of focus. The word used to be a lot, used a lot in sports. Intensity. Intensity was the word used a lot in sports. Football commentators used it and used to say it. And they would say, the game is going to be won or lost on the line. You see those linemen and they're, they're there down on hands and knees. And you get that picture in their mind's eye and they're looking at their competitor. And the commentator would say, look at that intensity. Paul defined his purpose in a single line. Paul says, I've got purpose in my life. I have something in my life that's beyond me. You ought to be living for something that's beyond you. Let me tell you, a person, I know this personally, a person who lives a goal-oriented life and achieves these goals <laughs> is typically pretty miserable because the goals are unrelated. I got a goal here, a goal here, a goal here, a goal here. I got these goals all over. I'm achieving all of them, but I'm not connected. They're not connected. And I go through them all, and I review them at the end of the year, and I said, I did this, I did this, I did that, I did this. Why do I feel awful? And I feel awful because I'm living a goal oriented life, not a purpose oriented life. A purpose oriented life, if you let me draw a picture of a goal oriented life first. A goal-oriented life is having a circle with lots of random little goals on it, okay? A purpose-driven life is more of an arrow. And in this, you're moving in a direction as a purpose. And I only may only get two out of six, okay, or four out of six. But that's okay, because I'm moving in a direction. I'm moving with purpose. I have an accomplishment that I'm stepping towards. I'm moving in a direction that I want to go. You don't want a goal-oriented life. Paul didn't live a goal-oriented life. Paul lived a purpose-oriented life. He's pressing on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of him. And I believe God will allow you, if you've got the eyes of you, to see that you're making progress in your purpose. How do I understand what I'm going to say yes to or no to? Is that I'm going to define my purpose and now I'm single-minded. This is what it's all about. In a sense, it's irrelevant to what's going on around me. You have purpose, all the other stuff around you is just static. Only I want to be a part of a greater picture. That's my reason to have purpose. I want to be part of a greater picture. By the way, I know this sounds selfish. I don't mean it to sound selfish. I mean it because I want you to be so focused using your gifts and talents that God has given you, where he's placed you, that the body of Christ is better for it. Amen. I don't care if you're better for it. You'll be See what I'm saying? It's not a selfish view. 
It's a view that says there's something greater. God has given us certain gifts, and he expects us to use them. Two or three more points quickly. He says, I forget what lies behind. Paul apparently wasted no time thinking about the past. Yeah. I have a theme. This is Ken out in the margins. This is not in the scripture. I have a theme, a hypothetical, that I'm convinced happened, but I can't prove it biblically. Okay? But Paul, after his conversion, would go around into house churches. They had been house churches. And Paul would come into a house church, house church and he would begin to teach. Right? And I'm convinced this had to happen. As he was teaching, there's a woman over there, and she's disconnected. And the more and more he didn't connect with her, the more and more he's attracted to her. Okay? And as a speaker, that's kind of where I go. When I look out right now and I see some of your eyes fluttering, I'm kind of looking at you and I'm staring down at you because where I need to go to maybe wake you back up. And Paul's doing the same thing to this gal over here. And now this woman, who Paul's not connecting with, is sitting there, and Paul grinding away on his sermon, and he's talking about understanding who Christ is, and he's going, and he finally finishes, and he comes over to her, because he hasn't connected with her, and he says, Ha! I'm Paul. She says, hi, I'm the widow Goldberg. And he says, widow Goldberg, how long have you been a widow? And she says, since you and your men came through on your way to Damascus, and you killed my son, and you killed my husband. Wow. I'm convinced it had to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It had to have happened. He is going around ravaging the church. He's going from house to house, taking men and women, equal opportunity persecutor, persecutor, taking men and women and killing them. I mean, just read Acts 8 and Acts 9. The guy is ravaging the church. And I'm convinced at that moment, Paul said, I want you to know I'm sorry. I confess to you. I am sorry. I apologize to you. And then he says, where are the elders? Where are the elders of this church? Elders, come over here and take care of the widow Goldberg. Who's taking care of the widow Goldberg? Somebody must be taking care of the widow Goldberg. And then Paul went out the door, down the street, into the next house church, and preached the message again. See where I'm going with this? He didn't get captivated. And he had purpose, and he's moving forward with what his purpose is. He didn't stop for counseling. He didn't relive the past. He didn't exploit his childhood. And, 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 and I don't mean in any way to demean real hurt. But what I'm saying is that was the past. Yes. Yeah. There's nothing I can do about that. No. I became. <laughs> There's all sorts of junk back there, folks. And we have been, here's Paul's imagery, not mine, enslaved in bondage to sin. If you will, we as natural man have been carrying around this ball and chain. Right? And Christ, the great liberator, comes along and he cuts the chain. And most of us go over there and pick up the ball and carry it with us. That's right. You don't need to relive that. You're free from that. I can't help that, Paul said. I forget what lies behind. Now, I don't think he means he's taking them off the hard drive. What he's saying is, and we should be saying, I'm not going to be captivated by those things behind me. That's right. I'm not going to let them push me into 
that box and make me live there. I'm a sinner. But Jesus said, I have come to forgive sin. And God tells me my sin is taken away as far as the east is from the west. It's absolutely essential that you get the directions right. If you said north from the south, if you go south long enough, you're going north. <laughs> yes. And you keep going north. But if you go east, you're going east. As long as you go east, you're going east. You mean God's got amnesia? No. What I'm saying is this. I'm not going to count those sins against you. I don't reckon them against you. Two more things. Paul kept a focus. He was clear. He constantly reminding himself of his purpose. He's training forward. He's not sidetracked. He didn't fall prey to a midlife crisis. That time when you stop and you take a look at an evaluation of yourself. Gosh, I know this well. Many of you here may have had goals to be Millionaires by the time you were 50 and all of a sudden maybe you're 50 next week and your financial statement's in the negative column and your lotto ticket didn't come in. <laughs> you're not going to make it. That's bad. Let me tell you the guy that's really got a problem and I've seen this firsthand. He's got a couple million bucks. He finally comes up for air Whoa, this isn't what I thought it was all going to be about. Mm -hmm. It works both ways. That's right. It works both ways. That's right. That's right. I'm looking at the clock and I'm going to say, let me net this out for you. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, everybody who's in the process of dying says three things. Faith, family, and friends. Mm -hmm. Faith, family, and Faith, family, and friends. Who's the youngest person here? Chris. <laughs> You're probably the youngest person here. Perhaps the lady behind you is the youngest person here. <laughs> <laughs> but I can take either one of you to the end of your life, and you're going to be lying in your bed, and here's what you're going to be talking about. Faith. You may be talking about those you know, snowboard trips up the Hoodoo Mountain. You know, or you may be talking about those trips you took to Portland and you're kind of giggling. At, Remember that time we got locked out of our hotel room and we were in our underwear? <laughs> Faith, family, and friends. That's all you're going to know. So I'm saying to you, why waste a bunch of time energy, effort, and money in things that aren't going to fall into those categories. Mm -hmm. Faith, family, and friends. Faith, family, and friends. That's all that's going to matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's the deal. At the end, Paul staged the course by being willing to give everything he's got. He says, I press on for the very goal. I'm not going to be detoured I'm in this until the absolute end. Mm -hmm. Remember our rope? That's the perseverance. Mm -hmm. Perseverance. I'm in this for the absolute end. I will give everything it takes as I achieve my purpose and my goals. And I realistically look at my life. This is what it's all about. There's a magnificent section of scripture in, a, in Isaiah, Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 6, we talk about Isaiah's vision. Holy, 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 he sees God. That's part of it. Isaiah sees God, but then something happens. When Isaiah sees God in verse 5, he says, Woe to me, for I'm undone. In other words, he thought he had it all together. But it fell apart in the presence of God. The 
This is how God has worked in our lives. Just like Isaiah, you get a vision of who God is. You get a vision of who we are. You come to a point in your life of salvation. And then rather than give up life, you're now ready to start life. Amen. God responds and he gives and he forgives Isaiah's sin. And he says, who should I send? In other words, there's a job to do. Who should I send? And Isaiah, after seeing God and seeing himself, says, send me. Send me. So I would suggest you figure out faith, family, and friends. And devote the lion's share of your time, energy, effort, and resources in those areas. And it's full throttle ahead. <laughs> What's he given you to do? Mm. What's he given you to do? I really think in all of this, what God has given me and is the ability to take his word, understand it with the help of others, to look at life, put them together, and say, now, how can I serve? Mm -hmm. As long as I'm doing that, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. How about you? What's he given you to do? See, it may not be anything like this of what I'm up to. It probably isn't. Maybe it's to be the light in your office. Maybe that's too bold. Maybe it's to go home and love your family as Christ loves the church. We, and this is so important in these times now as you look at the news, we as individual Christians, followers of Christ, have an opportunity to make a gigantic impact on the people around us. I've got no clue what God has asked you to do or called you to do, but I know this. If you want to stay the course, you look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12, 13, and 14, and you're going to see from the life in positive ways, some strategic ways that you can begin to put in place elements that will keep you focused on your course. Let me remind you as the music team starts to come forward. Let me remind you of something here. You cannot, and this is full circle, folks, full circle all the way back to last week, starting off the first sentence. You cannot stay the course if you're not on. Mm -hmm. I'll repeat that. You cannot stay the course if you're not on. Don't be going out and trying to clean up your life and figuring out purpose and all these other things that I just talked about. <laughs> it's a waste of time. You don't need that. That's a waste. You need to come to Christ in repentance and faith. Now, all those things that I discussed, we can take care of. Isaiah sees God and says, holy, holy, holy. And then he says, here I am. Take me. Mm -hmm. 